Everton FC, a team with nine Division One titles, five FA Cups, and one of the most passionate fan bases in the entire country. Yet the side have never been closer to relegation from the Premier League, having spent 119 years of their history in the top flight. But how on earth did it come to this? It was just a couple years ago when they were top of the Premier League, and even as recently as September of last season, they were in the top four. They've seen a ridiculous amount of movement at the club, whether that's players, managers, or staff. However, throughout it all, there's been one constant, Farhad Mashiri. This is the story of the unbelievable decline of Everton Football Club. Let's rewind to the 27th of February 2016. Everton find themselves in an underwhelming 11th place, having finished in the top seven for eight of the last 10 campaigns. But luckily for the Toffees, a huge sign of hope would shine over the side, as billionaire Farhad Mashiri sold his stakes in English giant Arsenal and took up 49.9% of shares in Everton. This made him the biggest shareholder in the club, as he made it clear he wasn't looking to make money and wouldn't be turning them into the next corporate entity like Man United. He wanted to see success. And so in the summer, after back-to-back -back bottom half finishes, Mashiri would sack Roberto Martinez, replacing him with Ronald Koeman, who just guided Southampton to a second Europa League finish in a row. Perhaps even more excitingly though, Mashiri brought in Steve Walsh as director of football, who'd be the man in charge of transfers at the Toffees, having brought in the likes of Mares and Kante to Leicester, which had led to their success in the campaign just gone. The summer would prove to be a positive one for the Toffees, bringing Balassi, Calvert-Lewin, Idrissa Gay and Ashley Williams to Goodison, with the latter having just guided Wales to a historic semi-final appearance at the Euros. Most importantly though, all of this was done on a net profit of £7 million, having sold John Stones to Man City in the summer for near £50 million, with it looking like they'd be continuing their smart business strategy which had done so well for the Toffees in recent years. Everton enjoyed a relatively successful first season, having added Schneiderlin and Lookman to their squad in January, eventually finishing the campaign in 7th before the summer window where they looked to spend heavily. Once again, Everton would sell one of their stars in Romelu Lukaku, getting £75 million for the Belgian, but this time splashed the cash in the window. Davy Clarsen, Jordan Pickford, Michael Keane and a legendary return for Wayne Rooney were amongst those who went to Goodison, costing over £130 million, with the goal of finally reaching their Champions League spots. However, after five games, Everton were in the relegation zone, with Coleman getting sacked nine games in after a 5-2 loss to Arsenal. Sam Allardyce would then be brought in on a short-term deal, with his sole job being to keep the club up. However, would still be allowed to spend nearly £50 million in January, the first sign of reckless spending which started to raise suspicion amongst the Everton faithful. Going on to finish 8th, they brought in Marco Silva to build for the future, with an exciting attacking brand of football. Mashiri also decided to sack Walsh as director of football, as he'd been an unimpressed with their transfer business, bringing in Marcel Brands as his replacement, an appointment which had gone to uncover the truth about Mashiri. Everton signed Richarlison, Digne, Bernard and Mina for nearly 100 million, as well as Andre Gomez and Kurt Zuma on loan, having only received 20 million in sales. The second straight season they saw losses of over 50 million in the transfer market, undoing all the hard work the club had done up to this point. Brands had been given the time target building a younger squad which would continue to grow in the future, yet Yerry Mina and Richarlison were the only players 23 or under to be brought in, which is where we see further signs of trouble start to come to the forefront. Despite all this though, Silver managed to guide Everton to 8th place with their second highest points tally in 5 seasons. Everton would then once again be aggressive in the transfer window, bringing in Gomez on a permanent as well as signing Delph, Gabam and Moise Keane and most importantly Alex Awobi for a combined cost of £110 million. The reason I highlight Awobi is because Mashiri had signed him without Brand's knowledge up into the latter stages where the Dutchman would even advise strongly against it, claiming it wouldn't be a good deal in the slightest. After a 5-2 battering at Anfield, Marco Silva would be sacked, which in hindsight would prove to be a terrible decision. Not only down to his success at Fulham, but also because it's now clear that the squad he had to work with did not align to what he and Brand had been campaigning for. Silva would then be replaced by Carlo Ancelotti, a remarkable pickup given his managerial CV. However, it was an appointment which had gone to cause extreme trouble at the club. Firstly, Brands had informed Mashiri he didn't think the Italian would be a good choice, given that in his entire career he's never spent more than two years managing a team, other than at AC Milan, and so if Mashiri was truly serious about building a side for the future, it just simply wouldn't make sense to appoint him. As well as this, Ancelotti came in and signed proven talent to help boost his performances, however meant that the £60 million they spent during the pandemic had little to no resale value, with Ducure, Rodriguez and Allen all now being over the age of 30. Ancelotti managed to get Everton going though, with the Toffees starting the season with four wins from four, even topping the table all the way through to November. And after a win on Boxing Day, they even found themselves in second, still very much in a potential title race. In the second half of the season, their form would drop off a cliff though, winning just three of their final 11 games, ending the season in 10th, a long way off the Champions League spots their fans have been dreaming of. And when Ancelotti was then offered the job at Real in the summer, Everton were left without a manager and with no backup option. Not only this, but FFP had caught up to the Toffees, meaning they couldn't spend any money at all, and with a squad of ageing players on big contracts that they couldn't offload, Everton found themselves in a very tricky spot. 
You may think at this stage that Mishiri would finally listen to Brant, given that every decision the owner had made up to this point was disastrous. But you'd be wrong. Brant had asked Mishiri for years to appoint Graham Potter of Brighton, a young, impressive manager looking for a project to stick his teeth into, but yet again, Mishiri thought he knew best. Now let's pause this storyline here and read out a quote. What else can you call Everton but a small club? Now surely the man who said this would never be appointed as Everton manager, especially by an owner already despised by the fan base. That would be ludicrous. On the 30th of June 2021, Rafa Benitez was appointed as Everton manager, having managed their rivals Liverpool just a decade earlier. Benitez's arrival was met with huge backlash from the Evertonians, with a group of supporters even going to his house before the deal was signed, telling him to back off and that they didn't want him near their team. Now of course, I condemn everything these fans did, as it's truly disgusting and should never be tolerated. But if you were the owner, surely you would see this and think it's not the best idea to still go through with it and hire him. Not Mashiri though, because he's super clever. What on earth could possibly go wrong? Um, maybe Mashiri should have listened to Brant's in the first place. Going into January 2022, Mashiri was set to hire his seventh manager in just six years at the club, with Benitez having sent the club into complete disarray. A month earlier, on the 5th of December, Marcel Brandt's left Goodison, something Everton fans celebrated at the time. However, following the true events that took place coming into light as the months went by, it became more and more obvious that Brandt's had never been the problem. It was Mashiri. Of course, Brandt's was far from perfect, but if we're looking at why Everton find themselves in this position, it's clear to see that he was not the bigger issue at hand. At the end of January, Frank Lampard would join the club, signing Van der Beek on loan and Deli Alli on a deal rising up to a potential £40 million, as well as the signings of Mikolenko and Patterson, whom Mishiri had allowed Benitez to make just days before he'd be sacked. After two wins from Lampard's opening nine games leaving the side in the relegation zone, Everton saw three wins and a draw from their final seven be enough to just about stay up. However, come the summer, and Richarlison would be sold, having been pivotal to their survival. The supporters had grown tired of Mishiri, and his stupid spending leaving the club in an absolute state. Despite this, Everton actually didn't start the season too badly, and by the 9th of October found themselves unbeaten and sixth and up to 11th place. Then, shit hit the fan. Five losses in just seven games saw them drop down to 17th going into the break for Qatar, as pressure on Lampard and the board increased massively. Now an entire month since we restarted and Everton have won just a single point, as well as being the first Premier League team knocked out of the FA Cup. Mix into this a number of injuries and poor performances, and the Toffees are completely toothless up front and shaky at the back. Although to be fair, their midfield is not always terrible. Luckily though, after four losses in their last six games against relegation rivals, Mashiri finally realised they should probably do something about the fact that they've only scored 15 goals all season, as they've sealed a deal for Villarreal star Dan Juma, with Fabrizio Romano even giving it a here we go. Finally, after six months, Everton have their Richarlison replacement. Oh god. Well, at least one of their star players isn't refusing to train. <sighs> Not again. Well, at least the owners haven't f***ed up this side so much that they can't attend games. Oh, I actually really thought I was going to hear that sound effect again. Spoke too soon. Brushing that aside and looking to the near future, things won't be getting any better for them soon either. Coming up against Arsenal next and then a Merseyside derby against Liverpool after that. To put it simply, Everton are and it's all down to one man. Now of course, not everything Mashiri has done is bad. For example, they've got a new stadium on the way, ready for Champions League football. Sorry, <laughs> championship football. But what's the point in flourishing off the pitch if they're dying on it? Mashiri has used Everton like a toy that he could throw money at, hoping to see success but not really caring regardless. Meanwhile, the fans of the club watched it crumble to the ground. After being a staple of the top division for so long, we are watching the death of Everton Football Club unfold in front of our very eyes. And as a fan who had to see my team go through something very similar myself, to all Toffees watching this at home, I've got just one thing to say to you. I'm sorry. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe if you're new. Also, if you're an Everton fan, please share the video to any friends or family that you think would also enjoy it as well. But for now, enjoy your day.